Welcome to Exagility. I'm your host, John Coleman. So, Jared, welcome to the Exagility podcast. Thank you very much for joining today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much, Jared. Jared, for the curious executive out there, I talk about UX a lot user experience what what is it really what's so important about it user experience in its simplest form is just what it sounds like it's the experience that users have users may be the people who directly use our product or service they could be employees they could be people who are benefited from our product using our product i, I was just talking the other day to somebody who's working on a project that is basically the software that an insurance broker uses to price and configure an insurance policy. The user is definitely the insurance broker, but it's also the administrator of the insurance broker because some larger brokers don't do the work themselves. They have an administrator. It's also potentially the policyholder themselves because the policyholder benefits if the insurance is configured and they get frustrated if the insurance is configured wrong, the policy itself. It could be the family members of the insurance policyholder because they benefit from the safety and comfort that the insurance policy provides. It could be any number of people who are there. The the sort of collective noun when we can't say a specific person is the default collective noun is user, but it's really about their experiences. It's about what it's like. We tend to measure experiences on a scale of frustration to delight. People who are not in the tech industry ask me what I do. And I say, well, all those things that have made you want to swear at your phone or your computer, I'm responsible for helping the people who made those things so that they no longer make you want to swear at them. And that's user experience. And Jared, is that focused mostly on products or would it also be in relation to services? Products don't work in isolation anymore. So you put out a software application into the world. It it has support. It has a sales process. All that's part of the experience. It may have a subscription. There may be things people do when they're offline, not using the software that's related to using the software. Take the insurance company example. Insurance policies exist even when you have no claims. And there's all sorts of things around them, making sure payments happen on time, making sure that the policy doesn't expire, making sure the data is up to date, that if your beneficiaries change, you need to go and change that. If you if it's auto insurance and you sell your car and you buy a new one, that the new car is insured, that your teenager who now is driving is suddenly insured in the policy. All of these things are part of the experience. So is the insurance policy a product or is it a service? It's actually very hard to distinguish between the two these days. A service design is just a resolution of design. It's when we're looking at all the different elements. At its lowest resolution, user experience design is basically the pixels on a screen. It's the user interface. What elements are there? What fonts are there? What visual design is there? How does that screen interact? If you have to enter a username and a password and there's a button to log in and there's another link that says, I forgot my password, all of that is the user interface. If we zoom out a little, that login form exists in a bigger context of an app. There are things you can do without logging in. There are things you can do when you're logged in. Figuring out what all those things are, what those interactions look like, what the screen does. That's another type of a UX design. That is what we would probably call product design or you application design, website design. So that's what that is. If you zoom out the camera again, now you have things that are happening with your customers. There are things that are happening behind the scenes. Take the insurance policy instance, the software that the broker uses, the customer never sees, but it affects what the customer does see. Uh, Customer moves 
their address and they have to change their address, there can either be an interface that the customer sees or the broker can do it on their behalf or the admin of the broker can do it on their behalf. They each have different interfaces. So how does that all work? When you get into claims processing, what's happening with the underwriters, what's happening with the claims agents, what's happening with the payment system. So all of that is happening behind the scenes. The customer doesn't see it. So that's more what we talk about with service design. And you can scroll out even more and we get into what we call ecosystem design, which is what happens when you have multiple institutions coordinating. In order for me to drive my car, the state that I live in, Massachusetts, US, has to have proof of my insurance. So how does my insurance company communicate with the Department of Motor Vehicles to let them know that my car is currently insured properly? And what is the process that happens there? Who owns that design? Is it the state? Is it the insurance company? But some collaboration between those. This is where we get into things like APIs and standards. So there's all different layers. And all of that, in my mind, is UX. All of that is user experience because... If you do it wrong, the experience is horrible for the user. And if you do it right, the experience is seamless and delightful for the user. And in a sense, it's like the quality of the design, isn't it? Whether it's a product or a service, how do the various people interacting with the product or service feel when they're interacting with it? What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's how they feel, it's what they see, it's what they hear. It's the human part of what we do. If we just had computers talking to computers, none of this matters. But there's a human element to what we do, and that's what we're talking about here. By the way, I registered for leaders.centercenter.com earlier, and the visual interface was the slickest that I've seen. There was hardly any text, but it was obvious to me what I needed to do. I put in my first name, put in my second name, there was a little plus with a circle. It was obvious that I needed to add my profile photograph there. And then it kind of brought me through a wizard, a very gentle, gave me a lovely welcome and so on. It was, it's lovely to see people who talk about doing stuff, doing it themselves. Can you tell us a little bit more about Leaders uh, Center Center and also the UIE.com? Uh, I think you founded both of those, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so Leaders of Awesomeness is the name of the community. It's at leaders.centercenter.com. And it's a community of 31,000 UX leaders who are coming together to, to think strategically. Basically answer the question, how do we drive better design and development through delivering better products and services that are well-designed? At some level, businesses compete on the experiences they deliver. If you're a commodity business, if people are just shopping around for the lowest price, experiences don't play much of a role. But there are things that are cheaper in price that offer awful experiences and people are willing to pay more money to get a better experience. And at that point, you better be thinking about what experience design looks like to you Otherwise, you're going to be in this situation where you are not able to compete. We've seen time and time again, business after business, finding themselves competing against a newcomer into their marketplace that has no experience against the years. I mean, just think about Apple and the iPhone. Think about the Nest and Honeywell own the thermostat market. And then this Nest thermostat shows up made by people who'd never built a thermostat who knew nothing about the market and suddenly everybody wants a nest that's the problem is that these companies that have not thought about user experience suddenly find out that's the thing that's giving them the biggest pitch and then they're behind the eight ball so we created this experience this online community called leaders of awesomeness which deals with that which helps say okay how do we help our senior leadership, how do we help our stakeholders, how do we help our peers understand that if we don't start thinking about the user experiences we're delivering, our organization is going to find itself out in the cold, left behind in a marketplace that has better experiences than we can muster. And I can say from my own experience, I just logged into Leaders of Awesomeness and I looked at one of the 
episodes. I really loved it. It was an episode of measurement and very naturally delivered. And I can see how people would get a lot of value from this. But what about UIE then, Jared? What's the target community for UIE? So UIE is our professional development arm. It's what we do to help organizations train up and be part of this. We have two main parts of our business. We have a school for new UX designers called Center, and then we have the professional development arm called UIE. And the UIE side of the business is very much about how does a medium and large size companies make sure that their product managers, their senior executives, their developers have all the skills, knowledge, and experience they need in order to deliver the best design products and services. So that's what we do. Cool. And it looked like a nice model, less than a dollar a day. You sign up, you get loads of content. So probably worth checking out. I wanted to talk to you, Jared, about some patterns that I've been noticing with design. And I don't know whether I'm just getting the wrong experience or whether I'm doing the right thing, but there's a number of canvases out there for helping people to figure out how to solve problems. I love the truth curve from Gift Constable, which visualizes very nicely that we should be building up some evidence that what we're building is the right thing, solving the right problems for the right people and so on and so forth with the right solutions at the right price. And it's a really lovely visualization of the problem really where people just deliver stuff. Marty Kagan calls it a feature factory. People just deliver stuff and they don't really check in that they're delivering the the right stuff for the right audience and so on. And there are canvases out there that help you to narrow things down. You might see... uh, customer value proposition map where you look at customer jobs and you're guessing who the customers might be, what are their pains and gains and all that usual stuff. And then you have a lean canvas, like a business model canvas kind of condensed. And you've got the lean UX canvas, which I really like. It starts off the business problem statement, which uh, I actually treat as a hypothesis itself, because for me, I'm not always certain that it's the right problem to solve. And then they get into, if, if you solve that problem, Box two would be, these are the measures that might change if we fix that problem. And then they use proto-personas, which is a made-up word for not to irritate the marketing people because they have personas already. Thank you very much. Marketing is is off of personas. They're all moving to avatars now. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That ship has sailed. Okay, cool. (laughs) And they have these... They have these proto personas where it's your best guess at who, what the persona might be and their unmet needs and wants. We'll come back to personas later on. The jury's out, by the way, you should have demographic stuff in there. What, what would be the outcomes and benefits for those uh, proto personas? And then only then box five would be what kind of solutions might you have? Might be paper prototypes, like fidelity prototypes, storyboards, whatever. And then what Josh and Jeff did a beautiful job was it's almost like Lego. You click together boxes two to five into a kind of hypothesis. And then you say, okay, what's the riskiest hypothesis in box seven? And then what's the quickest thing that we can learn? What could we learn in half an hour? What could we learn in a day, a week, a month? And it's an initiative process and so on. But what struck me is that we, we go down a funnel very quickly, assuming that it's the right business problem. Like what I'd love to talk to you about is how do we know what the problem is and what has been your approach from a design practices point of view to try and figure out the problem space. So I I have a slightly different take. I think we spend a lot of time trying to guess what the problem space is and trying to look inside of various metrics and data that we may have collected. And I think it reminds me of this game that my wife and I find ourselves playing on a regular basis, which we're in the supermarket and we're shopping for our week, and we're desperately trying to remember what's in our pantry. Do we have enough cornstarch? Did we need more cornstarch? I I don't remember if we need more cornstarch. And we play this game where we're gambling based on our recollection of what we imagine the pantry has in it, instead of just looking in the pantry. 
And I think that's what a lot of what people call problem space analysis is. You write down this problem. You say it yourself, right? You start your lean UX canvas by writing down a problem statement. And a lot of people just start there and take it as a given. That must be the problem set. Particularly if someone who gets paid a lot of money says it, then suddenly it must be right. The nice thing about, from a user experience perspective, the fantastic thing about user experience problems, the thing that we never take advantage of that's quite valuable is the fact that problems are stored in the world. If people are having trouble, if, if for example, let's go back to that insurance broker problem, just mm -hmm. to make something up. If the broker delivers a policy to the customer, to the new policy holder, and the policy holder doesn't understand the policy, then something is broken. If they can't tell this is the coverage they need, that's not good. And particularly if they don't understand the coverage so much, they're just going to go someplace else that seems to have the same policy, but cheaper. When in fact, the policies are not the same, this policy is actually much better, but they can't see the difference. That's a broken system somehow. Where did mm. that break down? Was it in the way that the broker configured the policy? Was it in the way that the software describes the policy? Is it in the document packet that's delivered to the customer that's inscrutable because it's all written in insurance language? What is it that broke down there? And that breakdown is costing the insurance company money. And they may not even be aware of it. They may just think, well, some customers don't understand our product. And they leave it at that. And it, yes, they're right. They don't understand the product. But it's not because they're dumb customers. It's because your product is inscrutable. And so if we can translate the policy into some plain language, if we can make the benefits appear and jump out, if we can show what's different between our policy and our competitors, if we can make sure that the software that the broker uses configures the policy correctly and delivers that value, then suddenly we can win sales that we weren't winning before. And that's the conversation, right? That's it. And we could say, well, that's the problem space. I learned everything I needed to know about the problem space of just watching customers try to figure out our policies and watching the broker put together the policy and looking at how the history of how these policies got written and described the way that they do. And we make it seem so mysterious. It's not mysterious. You know, Yogi Berra in the United States was a, a baseball player. Then he was a, a coach for many years. He was mm. famous for being incredibly wise. And he once said that you can observe a lot just by watching. And he's Absolutely right. He also said that when you come to a fork in the road, you should take it. And I'm still working yeah. on that one. But this idea that we can observe a lot just by watching, this is the nature of UX research. We go into the world and we see it. The more we understand what it's like, the experience of someone today trying to work with our product or service, the more we understand that, the more we can see where our product and service can be improved. And we can come up with outcomes that are matched to that. Those outcomes basically answer the question. If we do a good job on, in this case, our tools for creating new policy proposals, if we do a good job on that, how do we make someone's life better? How do we make the policyholder's life better? How do we make the broker's life better? How do we make the admin's life better? We can have conversations around each of those things. And that's the problem space. And if we miss something, you know what? The problem won't go away by itself. It will still be there. Yeah, I think I saw one of your talks where you were talking through a journey map. And you had a positive mm -hmm. experience as a country, the journey and negative experience. And you were showing that these are the opportunities. Uh, Absolutely. Is that, yeah. Yeah. So you, it's a simple yeah. timeline, right? So imagine a horizontal scale, which is just time. And mm. at some moment in time, are the people who we care about, the user, the broker, the administrator, doesn't matter whom, at some point in time, they open a window, they run a piece of software, they type in some data, whatever it is. So we can map each of those things over time. 
And then we can mm. ask ourselves on the vertical scale, was it extremely frustrating? Was it extremely delightful? Was it something in between? And we could map the frustration and the delight that happens over time. And then when we look and we see, okay, which were the most frustrating parts of that experience for that person, then we can start to talk about, well, that might be an opportunity. And if we watch two people or 10 people or 20 people, do we start to see patterns in where those frustrations happen? And if we do, those are opportunities that we could fix and start to create better experiences. And many of them will yield better business results if we do that. And I also noticed that you're talking about the Kano model. And it's difficult to describe this in an audio way, but there were three patterns that I noticed you talking about. I was wondering if you'd mind explaining at a high level what those patterns were and what the Kano model is all about. Noriaki Kano, Japanese behavioral economist, he wanted to answer what seemed like a simple question, which is, if I want to improve the satisfaction of my customers, what and how much should I invest? And so he was looking at it. Basically, it's a two-dimensional grid. The vertical is frustration to delight. And the horizontal is the amount of investment. And what he found was that things that change delight tend to focus and change satisfaction for the better, tend to, to fall into three groups. One group is just the straightforward accumulation of features. You're building a car, you're putting out next year's model of the car, you add features that this year's model didn't have. That sort of accumulation of features is one way. But another thing that a lot of companies miss is that people come to their products or services with expectations, some of which were promised in the marketing materials for the product or the service. But others are expectations that weren't promised, that were never mentioned, but for some reason, the customer still expects it. So for example, I have a client who's one of the largest charitable nonprofits in the world. And they have these massive fundraising campaigns that involve galas and auctions and marathon races, all sorts of things that people organize and put together. And a few years ago, not that long ago, they were suddenly hit with a new expectation of their donors that they'd never had before. Up until that point, when people made a donation, they would send in a check. They had just started using apps so you could type your credit card number into an app and they could collect the donation that way. And all of that was working fine. And then suddenly Apple comes out with this thing called Apple Pay. And Apple Pay is this transactional system. It's not a credit card. It's a different type of transaction. And customers who had Apple phones wanted to donate using Apple Pay and were suddenly not happy. They were frustrated that they couldn't use Apple Pay as their donation system. Apple Pay already remembers their credit card, so they don't have to type it in again. But if you don't use Apple Pay, you had to type in your credit card again. And that was frustrating their donors, which they didn't want to do. Now, here's the mm -hmm. thing. Apple Pay was not on their product roadmap. It was not something they were expecting. They had no warning it was showing up. It never occurred to them that anyone would want to donate using this thing. But now it's a critical need and they have to completely re-engineer their donation engine because mm. they didn't anticipate Apple Pay. And the donation engine is this massive bundle of business rules that are so fragile that the last person who's tried to make changes to the donation engine ran out of the building naked and nobody saw him there again. It's just this thing that is crazy making. And yet Apple Pay now means that they have to change this. It's a very expensive change for this nonprofit 
that really wants to put as much money towards the medical and not spend it on software developers implementing Apple Pay. And this was a huge problem. And it was an expectation that they didn't get to choose. They didn't say, someday we will support Apple Pay. It was forced upon them in the world. And this happens to companies all the time. A competitor comes out with a capability. The platform you use comes out with a capability. Somebody who's completely unrelated. Amazon has this ability to let you buy things with a single click. You never have to put in your credit card number. Now people want to use that all over. Why can't I make donations? I made a donation last week. Why can't I just use the same number I made last week? Why don't you store that for me? That turns out to require a complete re-engineering of a billing system again. Those are the types of things that are missed expectations. So those turn out to be really costly. So the investment is high and the frustration is high. And this is a negative from the user's perspective. And then the third thing that Kano talked about, the third set of patterns that he saw, had to do with what he called excitement generators. And excitement generators are basically places where you exceeded expectations. The customer had no realization that this was something they wanted until they had it. And now they're like really excited that they get it. I, I think about the first time I got to use Wi-Fi on an airplane. It was an excitement generator. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm 30,000 feet in the air and I have Wi-Fi. I can actually send an email saying that my plane is late to somebody who actually could anticipate that instead of me missing my meeting and then wondering where the hell I am. I now had this ability to communicate with the ground. And this was just incredibly delightful. And so when we exceed expectations and we anticipate people's needs, we delight them. Whereas when we miss their expectations, we frustrate them. And so there's this whole category of thing, which you could refer to as delighters, which are basically exceeded expectations or things that anticipate people's needs in a better way than they've ever seen before. One thing to keep in mind is eventually those become the expectation. Now I get on an airplane. If the Wi-Fi is not working, I get pissy about it mm. because that's my expectation that, that planes will have Wi-Fi. Yeah, standards raise and it's like the table stakes are raised and we have to do much, much more. Exactly. So if I could get on to measurement, Jared, I, I noticed a lovely talk that you gave on leaders of awesomeness today. And you were distinguishing metrics from measures and you were talking about Google's use of heart, which seems very similar to the logic model for me, except it seems to add task completion. And you talked about quantitative versus qualitative measures and behavioral versus attitudinal and so on. And I was wondering if you could give us the dummies guide to some of those. I know you spent probably half an hour, maybe more going through that one of your episodes, but if you could give us the bottom line on, on measurement, if you're in the UX space in design and you want to figure out whether you're making a difference, whether we really are getting a meaningful change in customer behavior, what would be some hints and tips that maybe you could give to the listeners? Yeah, so from an executive perspective, organizations run on numbers and not because executives have this fetish or something with the numbers. It's, that's not what where that comes from at all. But the phenomena is that from an organizational perspective, numbers are an equalizer. They are something that, an executive can understand relative to other things in the organization. So this is a really important concept for UX leaders who are becoming more strategic when we work on their strategy. This turns out to be a big light bulb moment for them because they don't realize why they keep getting asked for numbers. The world of UX is about experiences. Experiences are all story narrative based. Somebody did this and then they did this and then suddenly it was frustrating. So they did this other thing and that just made it worse. And it's all about stories. So how do you quantify that? It turns out that if you want senior leadership in an organization to say, oh my gosh, we need to do something about this. You've got to do some of the work of translating that into numerics. They have to understand how much it costs. 
They have to understand what a reasonable target might be. They have to understand how far they are away from the target. They have to understand some notion of we're going to make an investment. What's the return we can expect from that? Because there's lots of things vying for their attention at any given time. And all those things are saying, we're in crisis. We need investment. We need attention. We need uh, new solutions. And so how do they decide that the user's experience is key? And, And one of the downsides of not doing this well is everybody treats user experience as this patina of surface improvement. We'll build the service and then we'll add a good user experience to it and ship it. And Mm -hmm. they don't realize that's not how it works. That if my goal is to make our insurance policies more competitive by making sure it's absolutely clear what the value of our insurance policy is such that someone would pay a higher premium than they might pay anywhere else, but they're thinking they're getting a fantastic deal for that higher premium because the value is blatantly obvious. I need to figure out how to translate the experiential elements of communicating the value of that policy to that policyholder. I need to do that in a way that I can be clear that we have succeeded or not. So we've been working for the last few years on what metrics do executives need to understand how to realize, A, there's a problem with the way our policies are written. B, that problem is costing us a lot of sales right now. C, if we worked on it with this amount of investment, we could expect this much larger amount of sales in return. If I can do that, then this becomes a priority that people bubble to the top because it helps them meet their goals of increasing revenues, decreasing costs, getting to customers we're not getting to at this point, pushing up the average purchase value of our policies, the average premium value, whatever it is. And so I need to be able to translate these experiential moments of, wow, that's a document that's got a lot of pages and really confusing, and I don't understand what it says, into a number that screams at the executives that they'd be foolish not to fix this. So that's basically what metrics are about. How do we do that? There's a variety of ways. We start with an understanding of the outcome that we're looking for. The outcome answers the question, if we do a great job on the policy management system, the system that produces new policy proposals for customers, if we do a great Mm -hmm. job on that, how are we going to improve somebody's life? Whose life are we improving? If, If we're not improving the customer's life, the broker's life, the admin's life, then why are we working on this thing? So we need to first establish that. We need to understand what success looks like. And success is basically a change in the world. And then we need to establish some measurements, right? A measurement is just an observation of change. When my kids were little, I would have them stand up in the doorway and I would take a marker and I'd mark where the top of their head was on the door jam. And sure enough, my kids followed the predictable behavior of getting bigger every year. And so every year the marks would get higher on the door jam. I didn't have any numbers associated with it. I would write the date down. That's the closest I got to numbers. I had no idea how high off the ground those marks were. That didn't matter. That was a level of precision I did not care about. I marveled at the distances between the lines. That's all I needed to see. That's a measurement. Measurements can be very crude and yet very effective. That was a very crude and effective measurement. And in our world, you have measurements, which are the changes we observe. And then you have metrics, which are the measurements we're tracking, right? Because there's lots of things we could be measuring. I could measure the number of ears they had each year, but that's a number that doesn't really change. So it's not that interesting. I could measure the the distance between the pupils of their eyes, but that's a measure that I didn't really understand and I'm not sure it mattered. So I'm only focusing on one measurement, which is the top of their head. Where is the top of their head in relationship to the door jam and past years when I've made that mark? That's all I cared about. And so that's a metric. A metric is a measure that we track. So a lot of what we've been talking to our UX leaders about lately is how to translate what they do into measurements that you then track. And then report on to say, here's our goal. 
This is what success looks like. We're trying to get to this level. And then here's the progress we're making to that goal. So you can see how far along we are. And then if you really want to get fancy, you could say, this is where we expected to be this month, but we're not there. We're in this other place and it's not a good place. We want to be farther. And maybe if we had a little bit more investment, we could get farther faster. That's the conversation we need to have. Yeah, something I've been trying as well is I've been experimenting with metrics where I'm just looking at the trend and I'm not even setting a target because I actually have no clue what it should be. And it's getting better, it's getting worse. And then to kind of what degree? One of the things I love about the logic model is from the WK Color Foundation is they talk about the inputs, the activities, the outputs, which can be useful as lead indicators, but really it's about outcomes, trying to figure out are we getting measurable changes in customer behavior? And I love the pirate metrics as well, that funnel there, the acquisitions, the activations, the revenue referrals and retention. But I take your point that a few examples that you've given in a couple of your talks, some of these might be relevant depending on the context. So it's really about, are we making a difference to the people who are maybe interacting with the product or service? And is there some way you can find that without gaming the system? Yeah. One of the traps that people fall into is that they look to these internal metrics. The pirate metrics mm -hmm. are a great example, right? Adoption, mm -hmm. retention. Yeah. All of these metrics have to do with things that are important to the business. And they're not wrong that they're important mm. to the business, but they're not how the user sees it. Mm. Uh, a, a customer doesn't wake up in the morning and say, today's going to be a great day. I'm going to adopt four new products. They, they don't think in terms of adoption. It's not a goal of the user to adopt a product. And... The problem with focusing on the business metrics is that when we only focus on those, we create what we call in the UX world, dark patterns. Dark patterns are things where we're so focused on the metrics that we actually create bad user experiences. An example is trying to cancel a subscription service that doesn't want to let you go. So they make it harder and harder to cancel. Their retention numbers just hockey stick, right? Those are great retention numbers, but customers are hating them. They're doing their best to get out of these subscriptions and the service just makes it virtually impossible. And they're going around bad mouthing your service to everybody because they feel trapped and they feel like they're paying for things they shouldn't be paying for. One company that I was involved with increase their retention numbers by changing their monthly billing rate from 28 days to 32 days. And by doing that, it fell outside of the regular credit card billing cycle. So every few months, they'd skip a billing period. So the customer would think, oh, I finally canceled. I didn't pay for it this month. And then the next month, it would be back on the bill because the billing cycle was a 28-day billing cycle. And the product just fell there it was at the end of the last month and it's at the beginning of the next month so it just skips the current month completely and that's a nice trick but it doesn't make the customer happier it doesn't create a great experience so someone's going to come along and offer a no hassle cancel policy and win customers back netflix found that when they made their cancellation policy to be zero hassle Customers were more likely to resubscribe when some new show came out that they wanted to watch. But if they'd had this really bad cancellation process that was really painful and really difficult, they wouldn't sign up again because they didn't want to go through that hassle again. And so they were actually able to show that it was more lucrative to let people cancel easier than to try to retain them. And that the way you retain them is by just producing better content. Mm. And so if we're not focused on the experience that the user has, if we only focus on the experience that the business has, we end up going down these dark patterns and we end up losing. And we don't even know we're doing it. We think we're doing great because all the numbers are going up and to the right. But that's because... <laughs> We're measuring the wrong things. That's a lovely way of looking at it, Jared. Thank you so much. 
So I'm wondering, have we hit the UX tipping point? I've heard you talking about the UX tipping point and you described it as people, you know, in an organization saying we've met the requirements, technically it works, but was it well designed? And I think you mentioned in another talk, was the design not necessarily intentional? So are you seeing a trend at all, Jared, where people are starting to take design a bit more seriously? Yeah, so the UX tipping point is this point in a business where they've reached a certain level of maturity. And that level of maturity, before they get to the tipping point, they'll deliver a new product or service as long as that product or service technically works and meets all the business requirements. We can produce a description of the policy. We can get it in customers' hands. They can make a decision. It has all the right business requirements in it. So it states what we will do. It states what the customer needs to do. It's literally a contract. It meets all those requirements and we're actually able to technically deliver it when asked. And if that's good enough, we ship. The tipping point happens when that's no longer by itself good enough. When if that policy isn't readable, the value isn't clear, the customer doesn't think this is actually a good idea, then we'll say that product's not ready. We're not going to ship it yet. We're going to get to the point where that's good enough. And that's a hard inflection point for organizations, right? Because you're basically saying in the past, this thing would meet our standard criteria. But now we actually are taking some pride in our work and we're not letting things out that we would in the past. And you have to rethink the way the business operates to pull that off. Because if you realize that you're not ready to ship too late, there's all this economic pressure on you to get this out because you're, this new thing you've made all this investment in is not producing any returns yet. So that means that you need to re-engineer your whole process so that you're understanding what that definition of done is what that definition of this is ready to ship enough and that the highest risk things that are going to prevent you from getting to that are identified early enough so you can have enough time to overcome them so that you can actually get it out the door. And we've done this in other parts of the business. It used to be that there was no such thing as quality assurance. We would just build something and put it out. And many times it would break on the customer. And then we'd be in this back end process of fixing it or having customers swear they'd never buy anything from us again because the stuff we produce is crap. So we've been here before. We just haven't included the user's experience, the UX, as part of that definition of quality. And so we have to rethink our quality processes, just like we had to do in the 70s when we had to think about zero defect quality controls and process quality, statistical process control, and all these other things, Deming and a lot of the work of Drucker and, and all of these folks. We have been through this before. As the TV show says, all this has happened before, all this will happen again, right? This process is not new. But it does take substantive change inside the organization. It's culture change. It's dramatic transformational change. I have a, a saying, which is that there are two types of organizations in the world. There are those that are currently going through a major transformation, and there are those that don't know that they're currently going through a major transformation. This is the case where businesses don't realize that, that the world is changing out from under them. And either they're adapting to that change or they are not. But if they're not adapting to that change, the change is still happening and it's still affecting their business. And so that's what the UX tipping point is about. It's about this moment where we say, but the user's experience is so important that we will not put something out that has a frustrating user experience, that has something that is less than the quality standards we have come to enjoy. Just give me a eureka moment, Jared, because one of the topics that I'm working at the moment is sustainability. And in the week of the COP26 climate conference, there's a big focus on sustainable products and maybe even returning to services. And so for me, the eureka moment is, 
all very well to produce a sustainable product. And I don't mean like a greenwash and proper sustainable product. But what's the design of that product? And are people really going to use it? You might provide a sustainable product that actually nobody will use because actually they don't like the design. This is key. This is one of those expectations that people have. I, I pay more attention to the amount of plastic in the packaging of things I buy today. I never used to do that. I never used to care about it. But now if you give me a choice between something that's in recyclable product or something that is in something that feels like it has a lot of petroleum based products that are not recyclable, it's a clear choice to me. If everything else is equal, I'm going to take the thing in the paper-based product. People are paying attention to things they never paid attention to before from a sustainability perspective. I am very down on cryptocurrencies and blockchain and things like this because the environmental impact of these things is horrific, right? Mm. The technology may be interesting, but killing the planet to create this non-fungible token, I'm not seeing that we should be doing that. I just don't buy the benefit. And this is one of those things where expectations of the users are changing. Exactly. And very quickly. Yes. Jared Spool, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the Exigility Podcast. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Thanks very much for encouraging my behaviors. Brilliant. Thank you. Must remember as well, Leaders of Awesomeness. It's at leaders.centercenter.com. And also, if you want to look at the professional services arm of that, uie.com, where you can join other UX leaders to learn a lot more about intentional design. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, sir. Uh -huh.